Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. <laughs> Help me out. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's just helpful. It really is a bad start when it's like, nah, we want to go home. Uh, you know. <laughs> Good to be with you today. My name is Mark, and I am the lead pastor here. It's great to be with you today. And, and this is actually my favorite time of the year. I love the fall when everything sort of cranks up again. Uh, it is good to see you, some of you, good to see you for the first time since the spring. Great to have you. Students, welcome back. It's good to be with you. I'm starting a series next week called Reflective Film, and the idea of this series is we will take the films, the storytelling of our culture, and we'll lay biblical truth alongside of it. It's designed especially uh, for people who are new to church or new to this church. It's designed to make it easy for you to talk about and bring your friends out. And so next week I'll be using what is probably my favorite, although you can't really rate art probably, but uh, my favorite movie is Shawshank Redemption. And I want to talk about that film. It's a great film. It is an R-rated film for good reason. So don't sit down with your little kids at home and watch Shawshank um, you'll be sorry about halfway through, and you'll blame it on me. So don't do that, but it is uh, just one of the great films, and it's really a film about hope. It's a film about hope and how we carry hope, and I want to talk about this film. The clips that we'll use in the, uh, in the uh, sermon will not be R-rated, but um, the movie is just profound. I love this movie. And we're going to do a lot of this over the next couple of weeks. We're going to just take films and lay them as alongside biblical truth. It would be a perfect way for you to introduce your friends. So can I please ask you to, to make a point? Think of who would like to try this out. Studies show that people come to church if they're invited by a friend. And so if you'll do that, I think we can work together to bring the gospel in a creative way to your friends. Let's work on that. And in two weeks, I have such an incredible announcement here. In two weeks, we are going to have the editor-at-large of Christianity Today, Andy Crouch, come and speak here. Okay, So Andy's a, f a friend of mine, uh, has, has long offered to speak at our church when we would want him to, and uh, we're, we're, we're taking that invitation this in two weeks from this weekend. And you do not want to miss this guy. He is thoughtful. He's funny. He's interesting. He's, he's just got a keen kind of analytical mind uh, to think about where we are as a culture and where we are as a church. And, of course, he, you know, uh, he speaks around the world. So I, I just don't miss Andy in two weeks from now. And, and certainly he'll be part of that film series, too. He's going to play along with us uh, at my request. Okay. Now, uh, before I get going with the sermon, I want to talk to you about some big news in our church and what, just where we are processing some of the transition we had when Matt Stout fell in love and moved to North Carolina. Okay, so... <laughs> In the beginning, there was a youth pastor, and he fell in love and moved to the <laughs> North Carolina of all places, and uh, God bless him in that process. But we've, we've uh, actually been thinking a lot about this. So you might imagine that since we found out at the beginning of August that in September we're going to have a youth pastor, we thought a lot about that. And what we thought about is that this actually provides an opportunity. I think one of the great things you can do in life is... Uh, look at things that present themselves as like a problem as an opportunity. Like, what, what might God do with this? And it, we just thought about something we've talked about from the very beginning uh, as, we've, as the ministries have grown here. We've noticed how separate the children's ministry is from the youth ministry, is, is uh, separate from the college ministry, and how that's not very helpful. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to um, uh, promote Amy Carnell, who is our children's pastor. She's been here a very long time three months. She's been on staff with us. But when we were hiring Amy, we, we were talking already about how in a healthy church, the kids ministry and the youth ministry and how we send people off to college, especially that first year of college, are just so vitally important to be all of a kind, all as one giant effort in support of the work of parents and raising their kids. And so Amy's job is going to be uh, ministering to parents in a way that we haven't really attempted to do. We've taken stabs and you know, dribs and drabs here and there. We've kind of had a ministry of parents. That's going to be part of her portfolio, developing a ministry to equip parents 
in a weird time to be a parent, really, a tough time to be a parent. Amy's going to be uh, supporting you parents. We, we think your job is as important as any job on the planet right now. And if we're going to be disciple makers, we've got to help our parents really take the lead in that, which we think we are. And so uh, still her job is going to be like 50% kids ministry, like Debbie. De uh, when Debbie Fuscus was a pastor here, she was a part-time 50% or um, you know, half, half time she was working on kids ministry. Amy still will be in charge of the kids ministry, but another whole part of her job is, is the parent stuff and overseeing the middle school ministry and the youth ministry. And we're gonna tackle uh, both, or the middle school and the high school ministry, we're gonna tackle those in two different ways. One, the this, this senior high ministry, we have a very strong team in place right now, so much so that the kids had already organized in their mind. We, We've been interviewing the kids, the parents, the teams, everybody we could think of that has an opinion about youth ministry. And the kids had it all worked out in their mind. Who was going to quit their job? Who was going to become the new youth pastor? Like, this team is really strong and very well loved by the kids. And they're just like, we want to work with our team that we know. And it's, they've got tons of momentum coming off the trip to Houston, the mission trip, and Project Timothy in August. The, the senior high is just going really well. The people who have been making it happen are going to keep making it happen. They'll be supported in presence and in leadership by Amy, but they're really going to be leading the ministry to our senior highs for right now. And then we are also going to make a youth ministry specialist hire to uh, primarily work with the middle school, but not solely with the middle, middle school. We're going to see a lot of overlap of these ministries with uh, people of one age reaching down to the next year. You, you might see more youth group people involved in the kids ministry, more college students involved in the youth ministry, all these kind of like overlaps and kind of cross configurations where we are going to make a youth ministry hire. Uh, if you're interested in that, um, you know, apply. We want to talk. There's a way to do it. It's in the bulletin. We're going to make a couple other hires. We're going to hire to support Amy, give her an assistant to free her up for some of this work that she's going to do. We're also hiring another assistant for uh, the rest of the pastoral staff, just some kind of like a couple hours for each of the other pastors to get some stuff off their plate and also to do some bookkeeping. That's a lot of words that just came out of my mouth and off of my clock, which is for preaching. I'm done now. Okay, <clears throat> I want to talk to you now. Uh, first of all, I'm just really, I just want to say this. I am super excited about this solution. I think it is what God has done uh, it's just like, here's what's the bigger picture of this whole transition is all about. I'm very excited about what comes next in our youth ministry. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you um, uh, about gardening because I have been gardening a lot this summer. Okay. More than I have done in all the other summers combined, I have been outside in the dirt, getting dirty with a rake in my hand or something this summer, okay. When I was a kid, we used to sing a church at the song called uh, a, a, a song at church called "In the Garden." Do you know this song? I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses. It's kind of old school in the way it phrases things. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And what comes next? And He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. Oh my gosh, it's really good. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. This guy has a, like a strong opinion of his walk with God, right? No one has ever heard the God, God like I've heard God, you know? But it's just a beautiful song about being in the garden and hearing from God and, and what does it mean to spend the first part of your day just stealing away with God and getting in touch with God. And I love that song. It's a beautiful song. It's a little sort of uh, a little sweet around the edges, if you ask me. But it's just a, go a gorgeous song. And the truth is, it's an honest truth. It's not like a thing to say to start a sermon. God has spoke to me almost every single time I've been outside working in my yard this, this summer. I did a ton of work this summer. And God has been speaking to me. I have met the Son of God speaking to me about my heart, about this church, and I think I have something to say, which is not just from the Bible, 
but is like a current word from God for our church as we close out a, a season when we talk about what does Christian maturity look like? What is God doing? And as we go into a fall, this fall, we are going to focus, focus, focus on our church reaching towards people. The first thing is this little reflective film series. Reach out towards your friends. This is equipping you to reach your friends, and I encourage you to be a part of that. We're going to do this all fall as we move towards November when we celebrate our 20th anniversary. All right, let's take a look at Scripture. This is a, you know, quite a famous passage. It's actually not even been a year since I last preached on this passage, but it's good. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. You are already clean. He's reassuring the disciples. They don't have to worry. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. I'll also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's like your two choices, much fruit or nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. It will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the fathers love me, I have loved you. So now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and I remain in his love. I've told you this so my joy might be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love is no one than this and lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. A servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I called you friends. For everything I learned from the Father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that'll last, so that you may ask uh, in my name, uh, whatever you ask me in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. So I'm going to ask you to pray with faith with me. What if God said, I want to work with you, and uh, it will include some pruning right now? I want to shape you to bear such incredible kingdom fruit in this life, but it will require some pruning. And so we would say, God, many of us boldly prune us and shape us, work in us the, the kind of the master's touch. Where really, after some time, it would be like there's nothing that doesn't reflect your goodness and glory, nothing that doesn't bring joy, nothing that doesn't sort of spread love uh, to those around us and even to people that are way different than us. If you could do this, Lord, we would say thank you forever and ever and ever. And we really do welcome it right now. So now let your word bear fruit in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I uh, talked to you uh, before about the word decision. It's an interesting word, right? You got that little scission word in there. You know I love words, right? So scission meaning cut, right? So you have an incision, which is cut into, or an excision, which is cut from, right? Or uh, a decision, which is mainly take two things and cut them apart. So you would choose one, essentially. The word comes from this idea of like something needs to be cut, and decided against, I will do this, I won't do that. And, you know, a healthy human being makes great decisions. It's continually saying, this is what we're doing. Regarding this kind of opportunity that came to us this month in our children's and youth ministry, we've made decisions. Here's what we will do, here's what we won't do. That's just life, that's the way it goes. That's what pruning is, right? Pruning, a gardener prunes by saying, this should have life in it, this should not have life. We should cut this off so that this can do better. The nature of plants is they naturally grow. If, if the conditions are right, the plant will naturally go, but the plant won't naturally grow in a good way without a gardener, particularly when it's competing with other plants. And what can happen is tons of uh, growth can happen, tons of green can happen that's not necessarily productive. And the gardener comes along and prunes that which is extraneous or superfluous that goes extra so that the right thing can happen. And kind of theoretically, we would all say like that if there's something that is superfluous in my life, something that's just sort of like there, 
but it's not really bringing fruit. It's actually maybe draining energy from the very best of my life. Let's lose that so that we could have the very best uh, of our life. Now, I have been gardening all, all year, as I, I mentioned to you. And I want to just uh, bring to you kind of the concept of Pinterest. Do you remember Pinterest? You use Pinterest, right? Not everybody does, but some of us like that. I like it for this reason. Pinterest says, here's what other people are doing in their life. You could do this too if you wanted to, right? So Pinterest kind of puts out in front of you, look up gardens or fences or walls, as I have done, right? There's any amount of choices, like here's what could be. This is what it looks like when somebody does this well, including there's other people who put up things. This is what it looks like when somebody doesn't do this well, but they put it on Pinterest, right? <laughs> the Bible is like a Pinterest for your soul. It's just like this is what it looks like when it goes well. And even what Jesus says in this passage is that he offers you this picture of healthy humanity. That's what it looks like when it goes well. He is the vine, he says. He is, he is the example of what happens when God's garden just grows uh, perfectly. So here's the work that I've been doing in my yard, and then I will talk a little bit about what Jesus is saying, okay? Now, the Japanese maple is not what you see the arrow pointing to. The Japanese maple is in the back, and the people in the close can probably see a couple red leaves through all this. This was my yard in the beginning. It was like a jungle. It's not that there wasn't growth there. There was tons of growth there, but it was untended growth. In fact, the only tending we did was every once in a while, we'd take a lawnmower and go around the inside. So some of the weeds were cut short and some were allowed to grow. And it was just a jungle back there. Sometimes it looked sort of good, but mostly it didn't look good. This thing in the front with the Christmas ball, for heaven's sakes, hanging on it, <laughs> is a, a cherry tree. And it's called a volunteer cherry tree, I learned. A volunteer in your yard, it means accidental plant, you know? Like, it's just a volunteer. Like, nobody knows how the cherry tree got there. Somebody was having cherries one day. They dropped them, you know, whatever. Cherry tree came. That's a cherry tree. It's terribly, terribly deformed, twisted, leaning over to the side because there used to be next to it a giant silver maple tree that uh, sh shaded all its light. So the cherry tree is like crooking around, like growing, like I got to grow over here just to get a little bit of light. What's the guy? And, and uh, my tree guy was saying, you can save that. You can straighten it. I was like, take it, take it, right? This is how it all looked in the beginning. Weeds everywhere, kind of nasty. There's all kinds of things. There's an arborvitae that had a problem. Arborvitaes, I learned, are very, very soft and pliable. They'll bend in a lot of shapes be the absolute worst thing to use for making a bow, like a bow and arrow, because it's so soft that when you draw it back, it'll be like, I'll just stay that shape, right? So one day in the, in the winter, ice came, landed on uh, this uh, arborvitae, had two trunks, okay, that were sort of together. It just looked like one trunk, but it was actually two. Ice came <clears throat> and suggested to the one trunk, why don't you just lay down for a while, <laughs> right? And that trunk just goes like, that's a great idea, boom. And it just bends down. So it was like, you know, for a week, it was under ice. It was just like laying there. I was like, no problem. The ice will come off. And then now he's like, you can't get me up, man. I'm like this. Like now I've discovered this is a great position to be. Boom, that tree is gone. Behind it was our Japanese maple. We, we couldn't see. It's the best tree in the yard. And you can see the leaves of it just a teeny little bit there, OK? Now, Arborvitae is gone. You can see the Japanese maple, actually. There it is. A lot of things are gone, actually, this time. Our giant silver maple is gone. The weird volunteer um, cherry tree is gone. The Christmas tree that was in the corner, which was big, but kind of grown like some year in the 80s. Somebody bought one of those living Christmas trees and said, let's put it in the corner. That was way out of place. That's gone. Lots of things are gone. The only thing that's not gone is the little weeds all around the fences and everything like that, and the Japanese maple. We got rid of those. We... <laughs> Boom. That's Matt. Matt goes to our church. He's really good with trees. you got to hire this guy if you need roots taken out of your uh, lawn. This guy's got some major tools, okay? <laughs> this guy comes with some, some big... I wanted to run that thing so bad. <laughs> Like, can I do it? He goes, no, no, you'll maim yourself. You know, but <laughs> that thing does business cutting beneath the surface. And one of the things that I really thought about this summer as I was gardening was no matter what was happening above the surface, underneath, there was this network of, of roots supporting all that work. And I was wondering if Matt has one of those for the souls of people, because whatever their behavior is, I think there's a lot of funk going on down there. One of these, you know. 
you come in for counseling and Matt starts up his little machine. I don't know what machine that would be exactly, right? So we got the roots out from underneath so that we could grow some new things there. And then we had this guy come with a bobcat. That was a lot of fun. He also didn't let me uh, drive it, which I pretty much thought when I was paying him the big bucks that I would get to drive the truck, but no. You know, but I will mention this, you're starting to be able to see the Japanese maple, right? It's in the back there, you can kind of see it a little bit, you can see it there. All right, and then boom, clean slate, boom. Somebody's been doing some things, okay? We had soil delivered, we had a lot of soil delivered, not enough, it turns out. We returned the bobcat and I had to like spread five tons of soil myself um, on the hottest day of the year. That was extremely satisfying, right? <laughs> It actually wasn't satisfying, but now I feel really proud of myself for doing that. And we flattened out the entire thing there. Uh, and that, that was pretty good. And then, of course, we brought in sod, which has no spiritual parallel. You can't get growth from somebody else's life and put it on your soul, right? Okay? But we did. We cleared away everything. That's my whole yard there. Cleared. And all of that stuff is gone. And this is what it looks like now. <laughs> It's really awesome, right? It came out great. I'm, I'm so satisfied. It's, you know, more than you could even ask or imagine, the Bible says, right? So that's, no, we're, this is sort of what it's like. It's got a little bit more sod than that. And we're going to have a fence. We're going to have flowers and stuff like that. But it's really, it was so much stuff happening there. And what we did was, what I did was I kept making decisions. This should stay. My pretty little Japanese maple tree made it through all those machines and all that work because it was something that was, you know, there. It was supposed to be there. And everything else, all those weeds, all those scrappy Christmas trees from the 80s, everything gone. And now we're going to build. And I believe God wants to do that in people's lives. He wants to make decisive moves in your life. This is of me. This isn't of me. This is part of what I planned. This, this, this is what happens. Listen, folks, you will all grow. You will all grow just naturally. Things will happen. Things will get added into your life. Desires will spring up. It'll, like, it'll be like a jungle if you don't tend it. The Bible says that God is a gardener and he's gardening a great vine and you're part of that. You are meant to connect with God, but it will require pruning. Growth will happen no matter what. You will grow some twisted way towards some sparkly light. But God wants you to grow well and he wants to shape you. And where, where it's needed, he wants to reshape you. He wants to prune us. Here's what the Bible says, that he is the gardener. My father is the gardener. I've told you before, the word there is uh, like geo and ergo, like ge geology or geography, and ergo, like ergonomic. It's like earth worker, okay? It's where we get the name George. So you know all these Hebrew names, Jehovah Jireh and all. God's also named George. I don't know if you knew that, right? My father is the, the earth worker, he works the earth. He's working on something. This is Jesus on his last night saying, what is God doing in this world? He's working this world. He's working it. He's working it. And Jesus says of himself, and I, I am the true vine. I am what it looks like when the, um, the part of the, the garden cooperates with the gardener. He is the true vine. He's referring to Israel and the fact that Israel was always called to be the true vine of God. They were always called to respond to God and be pruned by God. But Israel grew wild. And Israel wasn't faithful. And some of the prophecies in the Old Testament are about the, the unfaithfulness and the, the kind of the, the perversion, the twisting that the, the vine Israel did. And what Jesus is saying on his last night is, into this world, a true vine has grown. Here's what happens when, when a human being cooperates with the great worker, the great gardener, and isn't his life beautiful? Pruned, clean, fruit-bearing, useful to anybody in distress or in oppression or disease. He just brings God by who he is. And folks... 
You are meant to be that. You're never going to be Jesus, but you are meant to be connected to Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. You are meant to be the vessels now for the bringing of the kingdom into this world. Humanity untwisted, humanity pruned, humanity fed and cared for and loved in a way that Jesus says will bring great joy to you. I say this, that my joy would be in you, your joy would be complete in a way that would multiply love, love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another in a way that would reveal God. That's the way it's all going to be. You are meant to be beautiful. You are meant to be tended. But it won't happen if you are ignored or you allow yourself to evade somehow the pruning of God. You are called. You are chosen. That's what the Bible says. You're chosen to bear fruit. You're chosen to... Bear fruit that will last, much fruit, he says. You're, ch you're chosen to bear much fruit. Three times in this passage, you are called. And from you is meant to be like this outpour. Like this is the, the garden of God. It's like e Eden restored. You are meant to bear fruit into this world. That's what God intends for you but it will require some pruning. This is it's a great thing to think about. It's, a, it's an important thing to have in your mind that you don't live as a solo act. You are called. You are chosen. God has a purpose for you. He's saying to his disciples on that last night, remember I chose you. Remember you didn't choose me. I chose you. I've called you and appointed you to go on to this. And then right after this, he says, and by the way, not everybody's going to celebrate this. He says, the world's going to hate you. The world hated me. Okay? If you actually kind of conform to the living God, you're going to seem out of step with a lot of the culture around you. And I think some of us experience that right now. But what we want to do is just say, listen, as much as something in our heart that wants to volunteer trees this way and that, we want to be like, wouldn't a tree be good like this? You know? and, and God's like, look, I'm the designer. I'm the gardener. And I want to shape you as you go forward. I'm the gardener. I'll decide what to cut and what to leave. I'll decide how, how, what needs to go and what stays like that beautiful little Japanese maple. Okay. In fact, actually, the Japanese maple took, took a pruning hit, too. I, I, I went out. I'm actually pretty good at pruning. I, I've read about it, and I've, I've got experience as a sculptor. And uh, that thing which was behind, sort of tucked behind that Arbor Vitae, had really strained to get out towards light. And uh, one day I just went out with the pruning shears and I just, I, just, I just clipped that thing so hard. Barb came out to get me for dinner. She said, what did you do? <laughs> and I'm not sure. I think she might have said, could you put some of it back? <laughs> but I really did go at it hard. But I know that thing's going to grow healthy and it, it will be a better shape now. Uh, because I was, I was strong with it and decisive with it. Now we're trying to mature as a church. We're trying to grow in things as a church. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to sink our roots down into God, to experience God as we we're worshiping here. This is, I was just thinking, there's, there is something that I want for every church in our whole world, really. But I was just thinking about our town and about our, you know, I was thinking, like, well, I'd be glad for people to go to any church where, that was founded, that was rooted on the experience of God, where the people who talk actually know God, where the people who teach, where you go to get counsel and you're talking to somebody who knows the living God. God, God wants to be known. And so we just say you cannot be mature unless you sink your roots down into God. We were talking to the small group leaders. Amy uh, Ross is our small group pastor here. And, and Amy is talking to the small group leaders uh, this week and sort of instructing us as we go into the new semester. And she was saying this, look, it's like when you're on an airplane and the mask drops down, they instruct you, you've got to take care of yourself before you can be of any help to anybody else. And the truth is, that's what we say to our leaders. Take care of yourself. Like, connect with God. You can't do ministry that's dis disconnected from God. The roots of maturity are a real connection with God. And the trunk of maturity is just responsiveness to God. We're the kind of people who listen to what God directs us to do. 
And everything in our life, as best as we can line it up, is like, this is me saying yes to God. And the hallmark of a disciple is obedience. Like, I'm going to be that kind of person who just keeps co cooperating. That's what Jesus was saying that day. I am the true vine. I am the vine that is true to the calling on humanity. I mean, more than Israel. You guys know Israel is like prototypical humanity. And Jesus then becomes like prototypical humanity. This is what it looks like. He's like the Pinterest of being human. Like, here's what it looks like if you say faithful to the gardener. Here's what it looks like. And so very responsive. We walk through life wondering, what's God doing today? How can I cooperate with it? We ask questions like, can I pray for you right now? And then out of that comes a fruitfulness, a, a kind of a, just a... a a kind of an expression of God's good into this world. That's what we've been talking about all summer. Is these aspects of fruitfulness. How when you are faithful to God, when you're rooted in Him and when you respond to Him, the thing that He brings in you is a character which is on the inside, the, like the advertisements you do on the outside. You are what you seem to be. Essay quam fidere. You know, I am rather than seeming to be something. To be rather than to seem to be. There's a lot of things that will grow in your life. But what God is trying to do is work on who we actually are. He's not trying to get you to act less angry. He's trying to get you to be less angry. He's not trying to get you to just like keep yourself from lying. He wants to make you into a truth teller. He's not trying to get you to like, like just suppress your lust. He's trying to free you from Weird desires, you know, weirdly ordered desires that have been left to grow and are de decreasing your kind of your health in your life. And so he's pruning all the time. He'll be talking to you. If you're responsive to God, if you're open to this, God will be talking to you all the time saying, is that, is that really for me? Is that the thing? Or I'm going to want to cut that, Mark. You're going to need to learn how to use your words. You're going to need to learn how to tell the truth and not protect yourself when you're feeling sort of squirrely about whether somebody's seeing the actual you. And then it's actions, like how do we act? Are we just sort of organizing our life around our own pleasure? Or are we sort of on mission? Are we kind of keep moving towards other people? You know, one of the magazines that's on the shelf right now is called Self, right? It was like, there's a magazine that's about self, right? And that, that's, that's as natural as can be, folks. I don't know whether the magazine's good or bad. I do know um, that you can get glowing skin and a healthy hair. And there's uh, 12 sneaky ways um, to peel off the years. <laughs> but that's not a life mission statement. <laughs> I have 12 sneaky ways to peel off the years. I have glowing skin. And if you spend any time with Jesus at all, he'll be saying, like, look, you're made for other people. You're made to bring the kingdom to other people. I, I loved Andrew's sermon this year, uh, this summer, when he talked about these guys who have organized to go into prisons that are mostly maximum security prisons where people are going to be there mostly until they die and teach these guys how to be good dads from prisons. What an amazing thought. Who even could think of that? And then that these prisons are becoming so... Uh, so kind of like um, saturated with Christian community that other prisons are like, how do we get our prison to be like your maximum? Like, how can we get there? The guys are starting to learn how to love and be ordered and not, not fight and, and uh, kind of express Christ and then minister to their families from prison. How does that happen? Well, it happens because of mission. Like people living for something better than glowing skin. Seriously. You live in a culture that will constantly teach you, this is important, this is important, die, you know. Look, you know what's important? Love. That you would be about something bigger than yourself and that you would order your life. And when someone is mature and pruned by God, they become like infinitely kingdom useful to this world, bringing Jesus good wherever they go. Or relationships. How we're, we have to learn how to do things like not cementing in place grievances and learning how to forgive or all the things we talked about in relation. How to like um, do ministry because the world's not just about you. Like you move towards people and you actually like say, hey, God, you've made me like this. Who's it for? How am I to be blessed? 
Maybe I'd like to be part of the new thing that's happening with the middle school team, right? And we just sort of like organize our relationships, um, including, as Kathy brought up last week, moving from a love of people who are exactly like us and think exactly like us to a love of people who are really different than us. And their experience is so different for, from us that it's a constant challenge to even believe that that's their experience or that you might have some culpability in that. We have to change. Like that's a, and, and boy, isn't that kind of the thinking thing? Where like if we're going to think like Christ, we're going to have to think differently than that, those kind of things that just grow naturally. That will take pruning, and sometimes a pruning will hurt. Sometimes it will feel really different than what you would choose for yourself. But that's what it means to grow in Christ. Jesus is saying this. Look, I'm the vine. God's a gardener. Your branches stay connected to me. Anybody that's like got any connection at all might expect that at time you'll get nipped back or, or God might whisper in your ear, that's not me. That thing that you're so, you know, committed to is not my best for you or for this world through you. And you'll be more fruitful if you let him cut it back. Just like my garden is going to be much better now that I cut it, most of it back. That's what God does. He changes us. He speaks to us. In Isaiah 30, there's this uh, famous passage. I don't know if it's famous or not. I don't know if anybody else knows it. I love this passage. though. Um, but it's like uh, the people are saying to their prophets, to the prophets of their culture, speak to us the smooth things. Right? Is that not like gross? Right? In other words, what they're saying is, hey, 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 Ugh, don't say that. Say something nice. See, like God's like a teddy bear and he wants to snuggle you. Right? <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm talking about. God's like a pruning shear and he wants to cut you. <laughs> okay. Pick. Pick, pick, what's your heart saying right now? <laughs> There's one version of the Bible that says this. It says this, like in every barren branch in me, he loppeth off. <laughs> Dang! Every fruitful branch he cleaneth. In other words, it's just going to, I'm going to shape it. I'm going to clean it. I'm going to sculpt it. I'm going to move it. I'm gonna, it's all going to be part of the garden. And, and that's true. That's true of you, true of me. And what I long for this year as we go into this, that we will be more missional, more not about ourselves, not, more not about like whether the church is good for us or not, and more like are we an expression of fruitfulness and blessing to our community, to our world? Are we faithful like Jesus was faithful to the gardener? All right, uh, impossibly quick, I'm just going to go over this. What leads to fruitfulness? Well, a good decisive gardener who knows what he wants and what he's going for, Right? Staying connected to Jesus, right? This is that famous thing, abide in me and I'll abide with you. In other words, don't live in two houses. You know, let's live in the same place. Let's stay cl as close as possible. I read this story about a guy down in Tampa. Uh, this year was discovered that he's been living a double life. He has two families in Tampa, two different wives, two different sets of kids. They all go to the same public or uh, private school, right? Which means... Parent-teacher night is odd, right? <laughs> right? They have both the moms, both of the wives drive Rolls Royces, take their kids to the same private school in Rolls Royces. Both of them have things at the school named after them. And secretly, unbeknownst to either of them, they're both married to the same dude. Right? He lives in two different houses somehow. Okay? I think there's a lot of Christians like that. Right? They're one person. They're married to two different gods. And they live over here and they scramble to have this life. Then they live over here and scramble to have this. And we buy Rolls Royces for both of the lives, you know, and we just try to make it happen. And someday it explodes like happened to this guy. And it's in the newspaper and I found out about it. And you can find out about it too this afternoon if you want to. <laughs> Look, you can't live in two houses. Abide with Jesus. Live with Jesus, and he'll live with you. You'll bear much fruit. You can't bear fruit unless you live with him, unless you stay with him. 
All right, and then prayer, this amazing promise about prayer, which is just profound and kind of like amazing. And what stops it? Pride. You can't bear fruit by yourself. And the, the person who goes like, look, I'll, I'll just do it my way. It'll work out fine. I don't care what Jesus said. That's going to be a problem. Disobedience, Jesus, the whole thing says, if you keep my commandments, you'll remain in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commands, I remain in his love. This how to remain with God is keep responding as, as faithfully as you can possibly do, and then lovelessness will keep you from God. Now, I'm going to show you a verse here, and I don't think I've kind of made my point well on this verse. Let's just I will close with one verse here. At the end of all this, Jesus said a bunch of things, including like, this is not going to go well for you after this meeting. I'm going to die on a cross, and I'll rise again. You're going to do all the stuff in my name, and the world's going to hate you. And one of the things that he said in the middle of this is this. He said, they will follow your teachings as little as they follow mine. <laughs> that is a stark thought from Jesus, like, oh yeah, you're going to go spread your life, and you're going to teach all over the world, and they're not going to respond that well. And I just put that up there because, first of all, it's a little bit funny to me, and I kind of know about that, like teaching a lot, and then, you know, did it work or not? But I also just want to say to our church, could we just say to Jesus, not us, not us, Lord. We want to respond to your teachings. And if you've had this problem in other towns, not in this town, Lord, we really want to respond. Let me give you a couple things to try as we walk away. One is this. Try just, just spend five minutes in the start of your day with quiet. Just quiet the noise. You're trying to grow. There's other people putting all kinds of fertilizer all over you. Lots of people want you to grow in a lot of different directions right now. Get quiet. Give room for God. And then intend to stay connected every day. Say, God, I intend to, I want to be connected with you. There's going to be forces all around my life pulling me every direction. I want to be your friend. Help me to love like you love me and how the Father loves you. And then just invite pruning boldly. Can you imagine that prayer? God, I, I might want you to be a teddy bear, but I, I really want you to be a pruning shears. If there's something in my life that's not of you, I trust you now to make that cut. Go ahead, cut cut. Right? You ever see somebody go real nervous into surgery? Like it's got to happen, but it's scary. What if you were just bold? What if you just said, go ahead, shape me, Lord. Shape me. Do whatever you want in my life. And then lastly, just ask big things. Like, Jesus, my friend, doesn't know you. They might know about church a little bit. They might know about religion a little bit. They might know something they saw in the news or some comedian was mocking faith or whatever. But my real friend doesn't know the real Jesus. And I'm asking you, God, to help them. That's a good prayer. Why don't you stand up and pray?